This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast Show 613. So you're the 10 year from now version of yourself can either say, Thank you, 2022 David, for making the decisions that you made that made me more physically fit, more financially fit, better relationships, happier person, better life, better family. Or you can look back and say, Man, I wish I would have done something before. And this is the same thing if you start right now and you look back at 2012 version of you. Are you really glad with the decisions you made, what you committed to, what you invested in? Or are you kicking yourself saying, I should have bought more real estate, I should have started investing, I should have got more serious, I should have dove in deeper. What's up everyone, my name is David Green and I'm your host of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast. Here today with my co-host, the amazing, infamous, and talented Rob Abasolo. Rob and I are teaming up to bring you an episode specifically directed towards newbies. On today's show, we're going to get into the five mistakes and six steps, making 11 things that you need to know to make money in real estate. Rob, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing good, man. I'm like, uh, I'm excited to get into this because I'm I'm really uh, at the helm of today's ship of the, the proverbial the the proverbial podcast ship, really taking us through kind of the journey here, hopefully helping some newbies out. And yeah, kind of nudging people along, you know, like that, that's kind of what today's episode is. It's like, Hey, I know it's a little scary to get into real estate, but let's freaking do this thing, man. This is what life is about taking risks and kind of working towards that financial freedom. And for those of the people that, you know, kind of get caught up on the, the analysis side of things, we're actually going to even be analyzing a deal in a very, very hot market today that, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but it, it kind of opened our eyes a little bit to that specific deal. Yes, we are. And we're going to get right into today's show. So for our very quick tip, I'm going to tell you, listen to the entire episode where you're going to get a discount code if you would like to save money on a pro membership and get committed into real estate investing yourself. And let's just do quick tip number two here. If you're too antsy and you can't wait to become a BP pro, then you can just go ahead and use promo code REPOD22 to save 20% off of your pro membership. You can do that by going over to biggerpockets.com slash pro upgrade. All right, without any further Uh ado, let's get into the show. All right, so today we're gonna be talking about six foolproof steps to get started, five common newbie mistakes that we see investors making all the time, and then hopefully provide the audience with a few tools to help them get started on their path to financial freedom and building their real estate portfolio. So I think the reason that a lot of people want to get into real estate, and David, you can feel free to give your POV here, but I think at the end of the day, we're all looking to build wealth in some capacity or another. And that means a lot of different things to a lot of people. You know, I think the big four components of building wealth in the real estate game is typically going to be, you know, cash flow, appreciation, tax benefits, and low pay down. And so when you sort of add all of those different components together, it is sort of what goes into this idea of building wealth through your real estate portfolio. Did I miss any pillars there? Is there anything else that you think might kind of contribute to that, uh, that wealth building goal that a lot of us have? I think you hit right on the head how real estate helps build wealth. I think the only pieces that might have been left out is that you can use different skills to do this in real estate than you can do it in other means. So like day trading or um, starting a business. There's an element of real estate that once you start doing it, it gets easier and easier and easier and it gets better in time. I think that's very appealing to people. It's not the same work over and over and over. Once you start to get more properties, they become easier to manage. Uh, The act of managing real estate gets easier the more you do it. And then I think there's also an element of creativity where you are sort of like the captain of your own ship. You can you can make things happen that you may not like. You, I don't know. It's probably tough to be creative if you want to day trade stocks. It's just it's very analytical. You're researching. You can't go into that company and add value to it like you can with real estate. And so real estate is more fun because you get to add a creative element of yourself. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, these are honestly the, the four pillars I just gave. They're very tactical, right? Like these are very tactical goals that you can set. You can set a cash flow goal. You can set an appreciation goal. You can sort of map out what the tax benefits are going to be. But ultimately, what I think a lot of this culminates to, at the end of the day, what we're all trying to get here is financial freedom, right? I mean, I think that's what wealth really is. We we always say we want to achieve financial freedom so we can go out and live on a beach and, you know, whatever that means to that person. But I kind of 
I consider financial freedom the same thing as wealth, right? Because wealth gives you options, you know? And so for me, I, I hit financial freedom probably about a year ago. And I think the the real, what, what financial freedom truly is for me is it, it's not like it's over, right? A lot of people think, oh, hit financial freedom. I'm going to drink a Mai Tai on, on the beach and hang out and it's over. I don't really think that's what financial freedom is for a lot of people because we work so hard to get there. It's not like you can just turn it off. I think financial freedom is you're <laughs> well for me personally, you're 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 stressing on how to make more money versus stressing about making money. And that's a very very small but very important detail. Like for me I'm like, okay, how do I keep expanding the empire? How do I keep building my portfolio? How can I take care of my family and my brother-in-law and my best friends and how can I help them achieve financial freedom versus a year or two ago, I was just like, how am I going to make money? How am I going to do that to actually achieve financial freedom? So I think there's a little bit of a myth. There. I mean, of course, I like going to the beach and of course, I like a good Mai Tai. But for me, financial freedom is just it's the the freedom to kind of not stress about the paycheck coming in and the freedom to really kind of take big swings in my real estate portfolio, which is, you know, kind of something you and I just did recently, even with our Scottsdale property. It's absolutely true. I think um, I, I there was a certain point in life where something hit me that you are going to have stress in one way or the other. You're going to have stress from problems that come from business. What property should I buy? How am I going to fix this? How am I going to fund this? Whatever. Or you're going to have stress from, I got a flat tire and I don't have any money in the bank to fix it. Or someone is sick and I want to go be a caretaker, but I have to be at my job or I'm going to lose my job and I can't make my payments. You have it in one direction or the other. What, what you and I have chosen is to have a better kind of stress. You're going to have problems in life. We have a better kind of problem. We have more flexibility. We have more autonomy in our lives. We have no limit on ourselves. But that doesn't mean that we don't have problems or that life all of a sudden we found the cheat code to where uh, nothing's difficult ever. No, no, I think you you nailed it on the head, right? It's a better kind of stress. I'm kind of curious, when do you feel, I mean, it's probably, you've probably been in this stage a lot longer than me, but what was that point? Was there a point for you where you're like, oh, I'm financially free. I've done it. <laughs> I've arrived. Yeah, and it, it, it happened kind of quicker than I thought. So at the time, $5,000 a month meant I was financially free. That was all that I needed to, to live on. Uh, I luckily had the foresight to see that inflation was coming and the, the money that I was making every month wasn't going to be what I could coast on for the rest of my life. So I kept going. But I remember it was a point where I'm like, hey, I have like eight rental properties. I really wanted uh, one of the the Corvettes, like the Stingrays when they first came out. I know that makes me sound like an old man, but <laughs> they were a cheap car and they were fun and they were fast. And my plan was like, I'm just going to buy one of those. I got the house I live in. I got eight rental properties. I'm good. And something inside said like, man, you're you're selling yourself short by doing that. Like the, the goal is not to not ever have to work. The goal is to work on things that I enjoy or make me grow. And so to me, it wasn't that I needed more money. It was that I wasn't going to become the best version of David if I just hung it up and said, okay, I've accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. I'm finished. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think as I kind of asked a lot of people about what financial freedom means to them and like getting into real estate. And I don't know, I, I kind of see the same problem with a lot of people, right? Because we all want the the financial freedom, the autonomy to sort of live life, you know, on our terms. And I see a lot of these things, a lot of reasons or, I don't know, apprehensions are very commonly expressed by a lot of people that, that follow me, that DM me on Instagram. And I think the big one, there's there's two big ones for me. People are very unsure of how to become an investor. You know, they listen to to bigger pockets, they watch the YouTube videos, they read the articles, but it, then it's it's very tough for them to tactically actually execute that, right? Because it's hard to apply that to their specific situation. And so they lack the knowledge and, and the tools to be able to begin their journey, uh, which I think is very solvable. That's the good news for a lot of people. And then the other thing, which kind of relates to, to the first thing, is that it's very confusing. You know, they're not sure what steps to follow. If you watch, for example, like my YouTube channel, I put a lot of Airbnb content on there and I teach people how to do that and I teach people how to start their businesses, but it's not linear. I, I don't necessarily like A to Z, here's how to do it on YouTube. It's just sort of whatever I'm going through or struggling with or however I'm kind of living my life, whatever I feel like making a video of and I'll teach someone through that. And so for people, I think that's sort of what what 
research is, is they're watching and they're listening, but it's never really linear. And so not having the, the A to Z steps kind of put in front of them sort of prevents people from ever getting started. Yeah. And that's the problem. Cause like most things in life, time in the market, time on task is what makes you better. You know, I think it was Malcolm Gladwell that talks about the 10,000 hour rule that it takes to become an expert in something. And I don't know if everything is the same where it always takes 10,000 hours, but the idea of doing it over and over and over is true. You get your black belt in a martial art by performing a technique over and over and over and over until it becomes second nature. That's how a lot of things in life are. And so the sooner that you start, the sooner that you're going to get there. And then I'll also say that with most things in life and real estate's no exception, the hardest day is the first day. Every day gets a little bit better than it was before. And so the investors that are kind of like hanging out on the background, looking in through the window, I would like to get started, but I just, I'm not ready yet. They don't realize that they're setting their future self back super far because it gets easier when you start doing it more. I feel I feel a very grandiose analogy coming here you, about ticking away at it little by little. I mean, there's so many things that I feel are that that I feel like are uh, floating around in David Green's head right now. Well, here's here's probably the best way that I would compare what success in real estate should look like. First off, people have to get out of their mind that it's different than anything else. Whenever you are sold on this idea that you can make money here easy, or you can get fit easy, or this is the secret to avoiding the, the uphill battle in life, that is always a sales technique that is meant to get your money. They're, they're appealing to your worst nature that's looking for like a get rich quick scheme or the way around the struggle. It does not happen at anything in life. You don't ever skip the work and just get a result. So you have to resign yourself to the fact that this is a journey you are taking. This is a path that you are going to walk. It is going to be uphill the majority of the time. And there are going to be things that can go wrong, just like everything else that you want to do, being a parent, getting in shape, uh, saving up money itself, all of it works the same way. And so what I like to think about is how uh, financial freedom is really a result of being financially fit, being disciplined, being good at money, understanding how to do what you're doing. And so fitness itself, physical is the closest example that I can provide to people that helps them understand uh, what this like being fit. <clears throat> not I'm not fit right now, but I'm trying to get more fit. And I think many people go through. Oh, cycles. that's not true. I saw you the other day. I was like, oh, homeboy works out. You work out a lot more than me. Well, I appreciate that. Is it that the camera adds like 15 pounds? <laughs> no, I had you on a wide angle lens. So you look nice and skinny. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Uh, the journey of fitness, though, is a journey. You don't get fit and stop. Okay, like many of us have done that where we got fit. We're like, cool, I'm there. And I stopped working out and I stopped looking at my diet. And what do you know? You end up not fit. That's how it works. It is a uh, the process of a creating habits that are a lifestyle fitness. And people that are into this understand it. They buy their food at a healthy place and they prepare it ahead of time. They put effort into uh, having food there to eat. They don't just leave it up to happenstance. They put it in their schedule to go to a gym. They probably are in a group with other people that are into that same thing that helps them stay accountable and helps them be supported. They talk about that kind of stuff. It is in their heart. It is on their mind. And the more that they stay in that community, the better off they're going to be with their fitness. Real estate is the exact same thing. If you're not in a community of other people that are doing this thing, you're going to fall out of shape. If you're not putting it on your schedule to go and do certain tasks, like go to the gym or go for a run or go run upstairs or whatever the case may be, you're probably not going to do it if you're just waiting for an opportunity to come your way. If you don't have a membership at a gym, the odds of you just remembering to wake up and work out in your own living room are very low. People tend to not work out very hard when they work out at home. Like think about Rob, everyone you ever met that bought some exercise equipment and put it at their house. Guilty. Right? Were their intentions good when they bought it? Always, 100%. Okay, you did it. Was your intentions good? Every time. But how often do you use that equipment? Well, okay. For the sake of your metaphor, never. But last night, I finally got on the spin bike that I bought my wife a year ago for the first time, literally ever. But I, I see your point. You're proving my point. You use it one time in a year, right? It becomes <laughs> a basic, like a towel literally rack is one what time. that stuff turns into. But if you actually get your butt to the gym, you're probably going to, hey, I'm already here. I might as well work out. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. Would you agree? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, by the way, this is exactly what I envisioned for this metaphor. We need to add a feature on the Bigger Pockets website that's just like the David Green metaphor encyclopedia. So we can just reference <laughs> all the metaphors you've ever done. 
Um, so, okay. So we, we've sort of talked about the two problems that I think a lot of investors face, right? Like the two apprehensions that they have. But now I sort of want to get a little nitty gritty here and actually talk about the top mistakes that investors make that we see investors come to us all the time and retroactively say, Hey, how can I fix this? And it's like, well, you made the mistake, but that's okay. You're going to learn from it. And there are five here that, that you and I have kind of penciled out that we think are very, very common that we see people doing all the, all the time. So first one here is going to be buying the wrong deal. Uh, have you ever bought a wrong deal before? Have you ever, or like, w- would you say you've ever gone into something that you're like, uh Oh, this one didn't turn out as much as, uh, as good as I had hoped. Yes, that's happened. Yep, same, same. But that's not a, you know, it's a mistake. And you always learn from your mistakes. So it's not like it's over, right? Um, ideally, you'd like to avoid the mistake. Um, but sometimes you have to make the mistake. And it's a little expensive. And it's an expensive uh, version of college tuition. Number two, uh, they analyze the deal wrong. This is something that I think, I mean, we could talk for hours on this. But I just had a, a student of mine who, you know, he analyzed the deal. He brought it to me literally yesterday. And he was like, Rob, will you partner with me on this? It's a 50% cash on cash return. And then I was like, yes, yes, I will partner up with you on it. Let's talk about it. We hopped on a Zoom. He talked me through all the financials. And I said, well, what about the CapEx? What about the cleaning fees? What about the utilities? You only have utilities here at 2000. It's going to easily be $7,200 on this. And I literally ripped apart every component of the deal. And by the end of it, it was a 12%, which, you know, not the worst deal in the world, but it wasn't the 50% that he thought he had uncovered. And I was like, so what did you learn here? And he was like, okay, I may, I may have, uh, I may, I may have underestimated the cost associated with this deal. So he analyzed the deal wrong. And I told him, look, I think it can still work in certain circumstances, but if you're, if you're analyzing this conservatively, it's not really going to work out for you. Um, and so this is one of the main things, I think. Like There are a lot of tools out there that can help people analyze deals, and we're going to actually talk about that a little bit later. But you know, we all go through it. I, don't, I mean, at, at this point, I imagine you're probably not struggling with analyzing your deals, but maybe young David, right? No, I would probably... Let me bring some clarity to that. I don't struggle with analyzing deals when they're in an asset class that I know very well that I'm familiar with. That is something I put in the 10,000 hours. It's very comfortable. But the deal that you mentioned that didn't turn out like I thought it would was my first venture into a new asset class. So I did not have a tool that would help me analyze those properties. And it was a different type of skill, kind of like switching from one martial art to the next. Um, I, I had an idea of how like martial arts works, but these are uh, completely different techniques and you're using different muscles and you're using them in different ways. So to your point, I would say it's when you are either learning a new asset class or learning real estate investing in general, that having the right tool to make sure you're analyzing correctly is extra important. So let's move on to the third one here. They A lot of people let the lack of money stop them. Honestly, kind of guilty here because you know, you see a deal and the first thing you think is, how am I going to fund it? But I mean, just even reading the Burr book, right? The the book that you penned yourself, my, my friend, that already starts opening my mind to, oh, okay, well, I don't necessarily have the money, but I can go and get hard money and fix up a property and then do a cash out refi. So I think the there could be more education on creative financing out there. Um, and if there is, a lot of people just have a hard time really comprehending that. Was there a moment for you that you've ever let the lack of money stop you? Or do you feel like you've always been pretty good at overcoming sort of like the, the financial hurdle for most of your deals? Well, you know, I will say that I was blessed to be in a situation different than probably the majority of our listeners because I didn't get married, didn't have kids, had a strong work ethic, was very driven. So I bought almost all my deals with my own money. I I just saved up a lot, did the old fashioned, really difficult way. And I recognize not everybody's in a position where they can do that. But there was a handful of times where circumstances came about where all my capital was deployed when an opportunity came around, or I was waiting on a refinance, but I didn't, I had to close before I could get the money out. So Mm, there are periods in my career where I'm like, ugh, I'm jammed for cash. And it's not that you don't have the money, it's just you don't have it liquid at that time. It's it's in a different accounting (laughs) section on a spreadsheet somewhere. 
So every time that's happened for me, what I've typically done is gone to a friend who is a fellow real estate investor, a fellow business person, a person that I had a pre-existing relationship with, not a stranger, and said, hey, I have no experience investing, but can I get a hard money loan or a private loan from you? That's really hard. I went to people that were in the business already that knew me, that knew how I worked, that that trusted me, and that knew if I'm going to buy this deal, it's going to be good. And I borrowed money from them and just paid it back whenever my funds came my way. And as you're saying this, I'm realizing it was my commitment to a community that op- that brought those opportunities. Like basically, if I would have waited to try to build a relationship when I needed the money, it was too late. That was something I had started years before so that when I was in need, I had people like, yeah, I can wire you some money. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. And I've also now realized, you know, investors that I've like worked with or talked with, they're all very flaky. Like not all, but like a lot of them can be. And I now as an investor understand that 90% of the time that that happens is because they just don't like their money is tied up. And so when you're talking to an investor, it's like, you have to take the money right then and there. If you say, hey, give me two months and then I'm gonna come to you with the project, they've likely deployed that. And it's very hard to, you know, to close that deal two months later. So little things I've learned along the way is like when I see a creative financing option or investment money coming my way, I hop on it as soon as possible because you're right. It's very, it's a very, um, real estate is not the most liquid industry out there. It can be, but it's not always the most liquid. Uh, moving on to the fourth mistake here. This is a big one. (laughs) This is perhaps The biggest one, uh, listening to other people's negativity. You know, if I had a dollar for every single time that I've almost had a friend invest in real estate, either with me or just pushing them to do it themselves, and they were amped up about it, and then the next week they came back to me and said, you know, uh, Uncle Ben or, you know, yes. Aunt Tia, yes. you know, said, oh, the the housing market's going to crash and this and that, you know, you uh, don't do it. And then they got scared. Oh, man, I'd have enough money to buy a house. That's for sure. I mean, people just get <laughs> you wouldn't need their money. <laughs> they wouldn't, exactly. <laughs> so it's like the, the negativity out there from people that don't actually invest in real estate. A yes. lot of the time tends to trump the actual experience that an insight that a seasoned real estate investor can give you. Yeah. And that is a tough, tough situation to be in when you're the investor, because you have me and you and Brandon Turner and people on bigger pockets saying you should do this. And then you have people that you love and you trust that have looked out for you for your whole life saying, don't do it. It's a very difficult situation to be in. And I can acknowledge it's not as simple as like, ah, don't listen to them. Cause how do you know to listen to us? You don't know us. Right. The when I whenever I'm in a situation like that, I step back and I say, how does this work at everything else in life? Right? Because real estate shouldn't be different rules than everything else. So if you wanted to go start um going to the gym and lifting weights, let's go back to that analogy. There is a chance that you could get hurt if you do that. You could drop a weight on your foot, you could pull a muscle in the beginning, your form isn't gonna be perfect, so you're probably gonna get hurt. You're gonna make a couple mistakes. Um, but not going to the gym at all is probably the riskiest thing you could do because your overall fitness is going to go down and then you're going to have heart issues later and like health related issues from not being fit. So you have to understand that when someone is telling you don't do this because something could go wrong, I often look at that like don't go to the gym, you could pull a muscle or you could drop a weight on yourself, you could get hurt. But not going to the gym at all would be the riskiest thing I could possibly do. And you got to remember that also. So what I tend to do is say, all right, who do I know that's going to the gym? And I should ask them, hey, you're really good at this. I see you lift weights and you're very physically fit. Should I do it too? Because that's a person who's in that world that will tell you, yes, you should or no, you shouldn't, as well as here's how you should do it. I would much rather ask a person that's in the industry that I'm considering getting into, would this be good for me, than ask someone who knows nothing about that industry if this would be good for me. So basically, if I'm trying to bulk up, I should go and ask Tony Robinson what you know what his workout routine is. Yeah. I mean, he's a great example because if you say, Tony, I want to look like you, Tony's going to tell you, all right, well, you're going to give up all these foods. You're going to work out this many times a day. You're going to have to be disciplined in all these areas. Your social life is going to suffer in this. And you'd be like, oh, never mind. I don't actually want it that bad. This isn't for me, right? Mm -hmm. If you go ask someone who doesn't understand Tony's regime and what he's doing, do you think I should go do that? What value is their advice going to be when they have no idea what that's actually like? 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, this gym metaphor actually makes sense. Cause you're saying like, you have to basically go and work out and get started and, and nick away at this little by little, which kind of leads us to the, the, the fifth and sort of final giant mistake that most investors make. And it actually is a very comp, like the famous four. It's the last question, right? People just quit or never get started along the way. Right. And so this big mistake is never taking action. If you don't ever take action, yeah. if you don't ever sign up for the gym membership, you're, there's literally no way for you to go to the gym. If you don't ever make an offer, there's literally no way for your offer to get accepted. You have to start throwing, you know, some some Hail Marys out there, if you will, and hope that they land. And then boom, you're in the real estate world. So, I mean, that sort of wraps up these five. But I mean, obviously, there's 20 top mistakes that, that investors make. But I think it really does boil down to these five for most people, you know, especially this last one. I would say are the most common things that stop somebody from getting in the gym and getting into being fit. Cause the, cause the reality is most people listening to this, it's not like they're not interested in fitness. They're at the gym, looking through the glass and the window, seeing the people inside thinking, I wish I could be them. And then they leave and they're like, man, they look at their stomach or they can't see their feet cause it's in the way, or they're huffing and puffing when they try to try to climb stairs or tie their shoe. And they, they are aware I'm not financially fit. I don't like my life. I don't like this job that I have, or I don't like whatever. And then they go back to the gym and they look in the window, right? What we're, what these five things are like the invisible barrier that keeps people from getting inside. And that's what we want is for people to get a gym membership, get inside, maybe start slow. Don't just run in there right off the bat, but get around the people that are doing it so that they can show you how to use the machines, go with you, work out with you, spot you, get you some momentum, like you said, and then you kind of get sucked into that lifestyle. Yeah. So I guess with this in mind, what I want to do is, you know, considering that the, for me, the big mistake here is never taking action and getting started. How about we actually run through a deal here? I would like to actually run through a deal and maybe just put some tangible insight and advice on like how you could actually get started today by analyzing your first deal. Is that cool? Yeah. Let's take our listeners through one of our workouts. So in the spirit of never taking action and getting started, I think we should put this into tangible terms for everyone out there right now that does want to get started. And I think we have a pretty solid, I don't know, six step process here for anybody if you are looking to get into Airbnb, if you're looking to get into long-term rentals, multifamily, whatever your niche is, if you follow these six steps, then it's going to be a lot easier than if you're just trying to like go after the big goal at once, right? I think breaking it up into small bite-sized baby steps that you can take one step a day, for example, you know, it's not going to be quite so stressful as just figuring out, oh man, how am I going to get into a hundred unit syndication deal? You don't do that. You, you do real estate. You get into real estate by you know, biting off small, small bites of your sandwich, David. And, and then by the end of the day, the sandwich is gone. So step one here, uh, commit. I mean, this, I know this seems like very, very simple. Like, oh, duh. no, like, I don't think so. I think you have to actually tell yourself that you're going to do this. Mm -hmm. um, you have to, you have to really like, I don't even care if you look in the mirror and say, today's the day I'm going to do it. Like that was me yesterday, literally on the bike. Um, I wanted to go run yesterday, uh, cause I haven't really ran in years. And so I was taking care of the kids and I was like, dang it, my window is closed. The kids are asleep. And I was like, you know what? No, I'm going to do this. I'm going to find a way I committed. I walked up, I got on the bike, boom, like that felt really, really good. So committing can be many different things. It can be like buying a small, you know, uh, buying a book, you know, a little, mm -hmm. I, for me, I always tell mm -hmm. people if there's a way that you can financially commit to something, like go buy a book, that's 12 bucks. It's a very small, the stakes are low here, but you can go and read that book. However you want to commit, whether that's you telling yourself that you're going to commit, whether it's you looking in the mirror and like poking yourself and saying, this is the day, bub, or if it's buying a book or any kind of curriculum or whatever it is, just figure out a way that gets you excited to actually get started. Well, here's why that's important. You're going to fail your first try at anything. All right. So going back to our gym analogy here, you go to the gym, you are going to try to figure out how to use a machine or do a workout. It's going to feel weird. You're going to do it wrong. And the thought's going to go through your head. This is stupid. You shouldn't do this anyways. This isn't for you. Or you're going to see another person that's stronger or fitter or in better shape and you're huffing and puffing and they're fine. And you're going to think, why did I even come? If you're not committed, the second that happens, you're done. You're going to leave and you're going to say, that wasn't for me. And you're going to go back to dancing with the stars. If you're committed, your brain's going to say, this doesn't feel good. How do I copy what they're doing? 
How do I find another person to help me? You're gonna look for a solution and that's why committing is so important because if you're not committed, you look for a way out. If you are committed, you look for a solution and it's literally two roads that you can take. One of them takes you to financial freedom and the other doesn't. I wanted to ask you a quick side question here and you Mm -hmm. can be honest. Mm -hmm. You recently went running and now you're riding a bike. Mm -hmm. When you and I were in Scottsdale, you saw me going for a run and you mentioned it and my understanding is you weren't running before that. Is there any connection to you saw me doing something and then the, put the thought in your head, you know, I really should start doing that too? <laughs> yeah, you inceptioned me, man. You know, after that Scottsdale trip, I was like, you know, something, something's not right. You know, I, I, I need something. I saw, I saw someone running. Oh, David Green, I want to be more like him. I should run. So yeah, man. You, you can take all the credit for what will soon become. No, that's not what it was. I knew you were going to go there. I don't <laughs> want to take the credit for why you're doing it, but I do want to highlight that that is a part of when you get in a community of people, they influence you. Because I was only running because I saw somebody else that was in my community mm-hmm. that was running and it put the thought in my head, right? So there's absolutely like something to be said for not just looking at, through the window at the gym or watching or or. Uh, thinking I should do it, but getting around people that are doing it will make it so that you want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And actually I think this sort of leads into step two here. And I think here, this is where a lot of people get this wrong. Step two, learn and plan. All right. A lot of people want to start with learning and planning and then commit. But guess what? If you learn and you plan, there's a lot of information in literally any niche or industry that you want to get into, it can scare you away. And so if you're not committed to it, the moment you start learning and planning, quote unquote, yeah. for everyone on the podcast, you're going to get scared and be like, eh, you know what? Maybe I'll commit later. So for me, mm-hmm. I like just jumping in. And so what this means is maybe that means putting an offer on a house and then figuring out how the heck I'm going to flip it from across the country. Right. And that's actually something I just did a week ago. I put an offer on a house. It's in Virginia. I don't really have any houses out there. And I was like, I love this house. I'm going to figure it out. I will learn and plan and find my contractors and find the team and research and reread the bird book afterwards. Because if I start trying to figure that out before I'm even in the deal, I'm not even going to get into the deal. So I think it's very important to just jump in and then learn and plan because there's so much that learning and planning can do. Um, It can really teach you. It can enlighten you, but it can also lead to analysis paralysis, in my opinion. I agree. So step three here, get leads. All right. So this is a big one. Um, You know, if you're looking to flip a house, if you're looking to get into an Airbnb, if you're looking to invest in a fund or a mobile home park or whatever, whatever respective real estate niche you want to get into, deal flow is super important. Um, You know, and not only deal flow, but actually assembling the team that you need, right? You're going to need, we all know like very basic real estate transactions here. You are going to need a real estate agent, which, you know, if you're in need of a real estate agent, a uh, small, small little plug here, the agent finder on bigger pockets can get you hooked up with literally anyone in the country. But we know that you need that, right? And we also know that you need a mortgage broker. And we also know that you need, like, if you're going to do like an Airbnb, for example, cleaners and handyman and contractors. And so if you can kind of assemble your team and really start figuring those crucial teammates that you're going to need to execute a deal, a lot of the times the leads are going to come in, like finding a good realtor. If you tell them what you want, if you show them that you're looking for a flip or that you're looking for some kind of investment property or an Airbnb, and you show that realtor that you're very serious, there's a very, very high likelihood that they're going to be sending you those deals. If you're looking to get into a flip, maybe this means getting in contact with the wholesaler. And finding an off-market deal that you can then go and flip and rehab and maybe even execute the Burr strategy. How how's your deal flow these days? By the way, like, do you feel now that you're established that the deals just sort of come, you know, like daily for you, or do you still have to actually go out and find them? It, It depends on like what avenue they're coming to me from. So, I have deals that will just come to me from the agents that are on my team. They'll say, Hey, David, this is one that you might like, or Hey, our client can't close on it. Do you want to buy it instead? So that will happen. I will get random deals in my inbox from different bigger pockets, listeners in different areas. And so I don't have to go looking for those, but if we're talking about deal, like the exact type of property I want to buy, those are not just finding their way to me. That's something I still have to go hunt down. Yeah. But you have a network, right? And I think that's, that's what I'm getting at is you know, obviously those deals are going to come a little easier to you and me, but 
you know, platform aside, I think that if you establish a network and people know what you do and you put yourself out there, right? And you put yourself out there on social media, on Instagram, on Facebook, and you proclaim to people that you're a real estate investor, the chances of these leads kind of coming across your desk more often are going to be a lot higher, I think, personally. Oh, that's 100%. Yes. So now I actually want to get into what I think is going to be one of the more useful segments of today's show. And I actually want to analyze a deal. Um, Because I think here's where the analysis paralysis sets in. Like people get really good at analyzing the deal. And even if it's a really good deal, they still get scared and don't want to do it. So I think this would actually be a very appropriate time to use the rental calculator from the Bigger Pockets website to actually take a real world deal and see if it pencils out. And, uh, you know, for me, I'm very, I'm I'm in Texas now. I'm very partial to Texas real estate here. So I want to just maybe pick like a very hot market. Like what's, what's a hot market right now? Like Austin. Everyone wants to move to Austin. Um, okay. So we found a deal here in Austin, David. And I think this one, I mean, who knows on the surface, I think it's going to pencil out, but the calculator is the crystal ball that tells all. So for the address here, well, let's, what I liked about this deal at initially looking at it is that it's in a very hot market. So people are going to be drawn to wanting to invest there. It has some value add opportunity. So when you look at the pictures of it, you can tell this isn't completely already done up. So there's some ways that you can rehab it, fix it up, make it look like more. It's currently being used as a rental. So there's an opportunity that if you like the tenants, you could keep them. But it's um, it's already been a rental property. So it's appealing to investors. And it's a decent size. Like It's not uh, a terribly small home that has what we call functional obsolescence. So um, like if it's too small, the fuller plan's too weird. If there's a bathroom right next to the kitchen, those are all less valuable. So at, a, at the first glance, this looked like an opportunity that might be worth jumping on. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, 515000 for Austin, Texas seems like a, like a decent deal at the moment. So we'll just pop the address in here. We'll do... All right, in Austin, Texas, seven eight seven four nine. Purchase price five hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. Purchase closing costs. I mean, we're typically budgeting about two percent for this, right? Mm-hmm. So that's going to be about ten thousand three hundred dollars. And will we be rehabbing this property, David? Um, I would say for this one, let's probably budget about twenty five thousand dollars for the rehab. Okay. So about $25,000 to repair and then our after repair value. So tentatively, so after $25,000 of repairs, tentatively for the ARV, we're going to put about $585,000 here. Um, obviously we yeah. can get more granular with this, but I think for the sake of this example, this based on some of the other houses that we looked at that were in a little bit better shape, 585 seemed kind of conservative. Right. Right. Agree. Okay, cool. Uh, so let's go to the loan details here and we're probably gonna do a 20%, um, unless, you know, your lender is a 25%, but I know that there are a lot of investment loans out there that will do 20% down. Um, if that's the case right now, what what are you, what are you doing over at one brokerage right now for interest rates? Are we in the sixes right now for an interest rate or in the sevens? No, for investment property, a lot of them are coming in kind of the mid sixes. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's what I'm seeing too. Uh, points for this. Uh, we do no points there. No points. Well, hey, that's that's not bad. And then loan term, are we going to be at a 20 or at a 30 for an investment 30. loan? Okay, cool. We'll go 30. So, um, so actually one of the really nifty details here, whenever you actually put the address of the house into the rental calculator, the bigger pockets tool here will actually spit out what the gross rental income estimate is for this property. So the median rent for this property would be $1,760 per month. Now let's hit our expenses here really fast. Now I know in Texas, I believe the property taxes here are like 1.25% annually. No, they're, I, they could even be higher than that in some places. I think we should be conservative and probably use about 2% for property taxes. Okay. So 2% is going to be $10,300. I just mapped that out really fast. And also that was our closing costs. So, um, so I'm really not that smart, but. It sounded cool. And then insurance, you know, annual on a property like this, I mean, I don't know. That could be anywhere from $1,200 to $2,000 is, is my guess. I mean, I guess it could be up to $2,500 depending on the Austin market. But w- what should we input for that? Yeah, it depends how high you put your deductible. So yeah. I think pro- like 1200 a year would be good. 
Great. Repairs and maintenance, vacancy, capital expenditures, and management fees. So what do you typically budget for your repairs and maintenances whenever you're doing this? We usually go 5% for repairs and maintenance, 5% for vacancy, 5% for capital expenditures. Mm -hmm. Management fees would be about 8%. And then the rest of these, electricity, gas, water, sewer, those are typically tenant paid. Right, right, exactly. Cool. So then we're going to finish the analysis here, and it should calculate for us exactly how this deal would perform for us. (laughs) Uh, So how does that work? All right. So according to the calculator here, this deal is actually in the red. It is a negative $2,206 per month in cash flow. You're losing $2,200 a month on this guy. Yeah. And you probably wouldn't have known that if you didn't have a calculator like this that would get you this information really fast. Because at first glance, this deal looks pretty promising. It's got a lot of the things that here has talked about on the podcast. It's in a great market. It's in a great neighborhood. It's already being used as a rental. And there's value at opportunity. This is some of the big stuff that you're looking for. And a lot of people would pursue this deal, put a lot of time and energy into it. And only after hours and hours and hours of their own time was put into it, would they realize, oh, I'm going to be bleeding $2,200 a month if I buy this property. Yeah. I mean, this is really, honestly, I agree. I think, you know, if I saw something like this, I'd get excited because, you know, right now, Austin is like the hottest market in the country, right? So in theory, almost anything out there should pencil out just because of the demand. But just running the numbers here, the actual mortgage payment on this property is $2,600 a month. And so if the if the median rent here is $1,700, then just right there alone, we're negative 500 bucks in cash flow. And that's not including vacancy, CapEx, anything like that. So right off the bat, you know, how long did this take us? Five minutes? Five minutes just saved us 15% more on our car insurance and from a really, really bad deal. And here's the cool part about this calculator. Even if you're not a a, a pro member on the Bigger Pockets website, you actually get to use this calculator five times, five times for free. Now, if you're a BP pro member, you get unlimited uses of this. So if you're actually very serious about analyzing deals, in my mind, you should be hitting deals five times a day, personally. I think if you're serious about it, you wanna get started committing, learning, and planning, Analyzing a deal is perhaps the most important skill that you're ever going to have in your whole entire real estate career because it's what's going to save you money and it's also what's going to make you money. So you get five for free, whether or not you're a member. But yeah, the unlimited use for me has really come in the clutch because we're doing this like so many times every single week at this point. Yeah. And it has a psychological effect as well, where real estate now doesn't feel as intimidating. You're not afraid like, oh my God, what if I get the wrong deal? There's this I don't know what what to expect. So what if is constantly running through your mind? And when you've got a tool like this that kind of answers the majority of those questions for you very quickly, easily, without a ton of energy, psychologically, it becomes much more easier to feel confident in what you're doing. So if you want a negative 20% cash on cash return, this is the deal for you. So we've analyzed it and all right, maybe it doesn't pencil out right now, but now I wanna kind of get into actually funding the deal and maybe talk about a few creative solutions that, you know, is there anything here that we can do to make this deal make sense? Well, the first thing that you got to look at in a situation like this is, can I add additional revenue? There's got to be a way that you can bump up the money that's coming in if you want it to pencil out. So you could reanalyze it. And instead of saying, hey, what could I rent the entire house out for? You could say, what could I rent a room out for? And if you're, you may get more per room if you multiply what you get per room time every room versus what the house is going to rent for. You may look into doing a conversion. Can I turn the garage into a separate unit? And then the last thing would be, can I build an ADU? Can I put a tiny house in the backyard? Is the lot big enough? What options do I have from there? I will say, I remember there was a bigger pocket episode, singular pocket, bigger pockets. There was a bigger pockets episode that I listened to a couple years ago. It was a gentleman that you had on from Seattle. And he was really big on like student housing. Todd, and he had like Todd, a house. I believe. Okay, Todd. And he had a house where it was basically he was looking for four or five bedrooms and he was tossing like people in every single room and he was making like crazy returns. So I love that strategy for something like this. Maybe if this house is only going to bring in $1,700 a month, it doesn't really work. But, you know, I know that it's close to one of the colleges out in Austin. So what if you chopped it up a little bit and you rented each room? Now you're looking if you could charge. 800, 900 bucks a room, maybe even $1,000 a room, 
depending on the amenities that you're offering, now this deal starts to work a little bit more. And then obviously I'm going to be partial to the, to the ADU because I built a tiny house in LA. And that to me was something that really made that deal pencil out for me. And that tiny house now is bringing anywhere from $2,500 to $3,000 a month. The mortgage on my LA property is $4,400 a month. So it just chops a significant amount of my mortgage just by adding an ADU. So th there's a couple of creative solutions there. Um, we don't have to get into the nitty gritty, but I think the, any of those three can work. Um, this could even work as a house hack too. If you want to live in the main bedroom and then rent out the other two rooms, mm -hmm. I mean, that would be great. If you want to do the STR house hack where you rent out each room on Airbnb and charge $50 a night, that could work too. So, so many solutions here that could make this deal work. But lastly, I mean, now that we've kind of figured out, you know, funding it and making it work and making it pencil out, if if we're able to do that with this property, the final step here is honestly kind of, it's a few, but they all go hand in hand together. And that's going to be buy it, right? Close on it and then manage it, whether you're self-managing it or you're hiring a property management company to do it, that is eventually just going to lead to, you know, building the wealth of your of your personal portfolio, because if you self-manage it, you're going to save money. That's money that you're going to be able to save and reinvest a lot more. If you decide to give it out to a property management company, well, now it's a completely passive investment. And if it's a completely passive investment, that also puts you a little bit closer to that path towards financial freedom, because you're now making passive income versus active in income. There you go. That's it. We did it. We did. We analyzed this, a deal here in, you know, I don't know, 40, 50 minutes. And it wasn't really, I mean, the actual analysis of the deal took us five minutes. Um, and it helps, you know, it helps to run this exercise over and over and over again, which is why that calculator has been so clutch for us whenever we're actually looking for our deals too. So I don't know where everyone's at today in their investment journey. I mean, we have a really big audience and everyone's just at in their own step, in their own journey, right? But I do know that there's one thing that's true for all newbies, for everyone looking for all the green investors, all the rookies out there that are looking to get started today. The one truth is that it's scary. It's scary. It's a scary thing to get into your first deal. And it gets less scary as you go, but it's really, you know, you should use that fear to drive you a little bit, you know? I think turn your fear into curiosity. That's, that's how I always approach all of my deals. So this is what it looks like to jump into real estate. Like what the exercise that David and I just ran we literally just analyzed a property and we took action. And this is what it can look like for you too. But you can only ever get started in real estate if you take action. Yeah, and this brings us back to when we said the first step is you have to commit. The first step to action is not getting out and doing something. The first step in action is committing to the process of doing something because there's always gonna be something that makes you wanna quit. So I like to look at using tools like this as a sign that I am committed to something. So if I started a construction business and I was a contractor and I was going to go out and I was going to build a deck in someone's backyard and that was my business, I was going to build decks or build fences, do some kind of woodworking. If I was not committed to that, I would buy the cheapest thing I could or borrow a hammer, get a bunch of nails, and I would put them in one by one. I would manually put in every nail because it's the cheapest way and therefore in my head, it's the least risky. The problem is it would be so slow going that as new opportunities came and I could build a new deck, I wouldn't be able to go do it because I'm still working on the one that I'm trying to put together. Furthermore, I'm going to hit my finger more times using a hammer. I'm going to bend more nails. It's going to be overall much more hard on my body and I'm going to get tired faster and need to take more breaks. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to do it the wrong way and I'm going to hurt myself. And it's the same thing with real estate investing. If you're trying to do all of this by hand, you're going to end up losing money and making mistakes that you wouldn't make if you had a tool. Now, compare this to someone who's a contractor and buys a nail gun. They load it up with the nails. They go right down. They're all put in there. They did not make mistakes. They did not get hurt by hitting their thumb with the hammer. They didn't bend nails. That's a person who's committed to working that business. And this is the way that I tend to look at tools. If I'm committed to doing something well, I'm going to invest a little bit of money and time and effort into buying tools to help me do it. A good example of this, to go back to our gym analogy, is some weight gloves. 
If you try to go work out and you don't have gloves, you're going to get calluses on your hands. You're going to cut your skin and you're going to have to take time off from the gym to let yourself heal. If you buy a pair of $25 weight gloves, it is spending a little bit of money, but it's overall going to make sure you stay in the gym more often and it reduces some injuries. So people that are willing to buy, not I'm not saying buy like a $50,000 truck for your construction business before you have business. That doesn't make sense. But something as small right. as, as a nail gun does. 100%. And I also want to say like we're talking about taking action, but if you really want to hit your goals, it's really more about taking consistent action, right? So you don't just go and bench press one time, you know, and then that's it. You can bench press 300 pounds. Now you have to do it routine, right? It's got to be your, your regimen. You got to be doing it weekly, right? You got to build those skills. So if you're committed to doing that and you're committed to taking action and becoming a better real estate investor, then let's talk about really quickly here how Bigger Pockets Pro can help you get into more deals faster with less risk. Bigger Pockets Pro also helps you become a better investor with curated articles and video content. Uh, you get webinar replays and exclusive articles covering everything you need to know to make smart investments and avoid bad markets. And if I'm not mistaken, David, I think you actually have a, a little workshop in there, right? That people can go and watch. Yeah. So Brandon and I made a series on buying with no and low money down. That was fantastic. It's probably, I think the best work that he and I ever did together. When we were making it, we just knew like, God, this is so good. So you get access to that video. And then there's a lot of other ones. Every webinar that Bigger Pockets has ever done, you get access to those. You get access to videos that Brandon did where he interviewed experts on things like driving for dollars, door knocking, using relationships to get deals, where he interviewed experts in those fields. And then the information's out there for everybody to watch, as well as things like uh, like world-renowned economists, uh, different bigger pockets personalities like Anson Young talking about finding and funding great deals. There's stuff in there for like specific to investing in Canada or SEO related information, basically specific niches within real estate investings where we at Bigger Pockets have interviewed experts in there and have made that content available only to pro members. Yeah, that I mean, it is a wealth of knowledge in that vault. So I definitely recommend diving into that the moment you become a pro. And also, you know, once you become a pro, you get the bragging rights. You get, you get a little uh you get a little uh, pro badge there that shows next to your name that shows people that you're serious, you know? You you get that badge of honor uh, that shows up next to your name that everyone can see on the forum. So, if you're if you're vain like me, that's always very important. But uh aside from that too, you can save time and money and th honestly, this one comes in the clutch often and minimize all of your risk with lawyer approved lease documents for all 50 states. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the long term game and you're using lease a lot, boom, like we supply you with a whole library of documents that you can use and they've already been vetted by the Bigger Pockets legal team. Yeah, that's big because some people like to manage their own properties. So if that's you and you don't want to have to try to figure out like, hey, is this lease good or where do I get a lease? You could download it right off of Bigger Pockets. They've already had lawyers look over it and give it the the good old you're good to go here. So I feel like just that alone, someone could spend an entire day on Google looking for different lease documents mm -hmm. and comparing one to the next. That'll save a ton of time. And I have. <laughs> um, and then uh, and then you also save like thousands of dollars on loans and other tools that you'll use in your overall real estate business with Bigger Pockets perks. Plus, you'll get access to discounted educational boot camps. I know Tony Robinson just did one on short-term rentals and very good feedback from everybody. Everybody loved it. So all these boot camps all focus on very specific niches from you know some of the best pros in the industry. And another thing, and we kind of got a glimpse into this earlier, you can also accurately estimate rental rates based on local property comps. So you can put in your address and the Bigger Pockets rent estimator tool will help you understand what the possible projections are for that specific property. Yeah, and that is also huge. So what we're basically looking to do is take away all the points where an investor starts down the journey or starts up the journey, I should say, because it's typically an uphill battle. You're going to get some exercise, but like you only get the best view at the very top right? And you get stuck. So it's like you're walking, there's a dead end. I don't know what to do. That's when people quit or they turn around and they go back downhill. So the lease documents is one that people get stuck on. Not knowing what income to expect, right? Like the calculator will help you figure out all your expenses, but you need income to put into it to know what to get. Well, the rent estimator tool is very accurate. I rely on it all the time and it does the work for you. You type in the address of the property you want and it goes, boom, here's what you can expect to get for rents. And then here are all the comparables that we're pulling this from. And oh yeah, click on that comparable and look to see and verify that it does look like your property. It makes it incredibly easy. Right. 
ultimately just saves you money, right? And the investments that you're making and uh, which kind of bring me to today, like the, we're actually have an offer out. If you decide to become a BP pro today, you'll actually save 20% on your annual pro membership. And in order to do so, whenever you go and you sign up, just make sure to use promo code REPOD22. That's R-E-P-O-D-22. So you, you're probably, and, and just for clarity, I know a lot of you are probably wondering like, well, how much is Bigger Pockets Pro? Annually, Bigger Pockets Pro is typically $390. But again, if you sign up today after that 20% discount, it is $312. So you're saving, I mean, it's pretty significant, 78 bucks that you just saved today. I mean, most of you were probably already going to sign up for Bigger Pockets Pro. So if you've been thinking about doing it, I would hop on this because the 20% isn't really around all the time. So if you're looking to take action and get started today, all you have to do is go to biggerpockets.com slash pro upgrade. And again, the promo code for that is going to be REPOD22, and that's going to save you 20%. That's REPOD22, and you'll get 20% off of your pro membership when you do that. There's a ton of other perks that are associated with this, by the way, that we didn't even get into because we're running short on time, but just know that there is so much more than we just discussed. So truly, you have nothing to lose here. I mean, you it's a 30-day money-back guarantee. Uh, I think this is about as safe of an investment as you can make because there's no refunds in real estate usually. So with all that, I mean, you just took this journey with me and Dave just on this deal, but also you, if you've been following along on the podcast, you know that we're taking a journey that we're, you know, letting everyone follow along with, right? We just bought a $3.25 million house in Scottsdale, Arizona, and we're excited to share that with you because we really do believe in transparency, sharing with the audience, bringing people in with us and sharing the insight so that you can learn as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I got to say that property felt like getting to the top of a hike and having the amazing view. I mean, it has amazing views that might be. It has an amazing like view. Yeah. 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 But it, sure. it wasn't just like other, other decisions I made were a good business decision. And so it was kind of like, Hey, I hiked to the top and now I get to rest. And so I feel good about myself, but this was amazing. It felt so good. It was one of those things where you're like, this is why I've been working so hard and delaying gratification so much was to get access to properties like this that are just fun. I mean, we're going to make good money with this deal, but we're also going to make good memories there. We're going to be able to have masterminds and groups together where we go out and we teach people about real estate investing, and we're going to get to share this with other people, open their eyes change their lives. But you never would get this amazing view that we got from that property if we were not steady staying on our hike, if we weren't surrounded by other people that are doing the same things as us, learning from them, helping them, and creating community. In fact, it's the community itself that's going to make this property so fun because they're the ones that are going to be joining with us at the deal. And this is why you want to get involved and get a gym membership and get involved in the community, right? Or find a group that hikes with you and go hiking together, whatever analogy you want to use. You want to get deeper into the real estate investing community. And Bigger Pockets Pro is probably the biggest and best community of investors in the world. I mean, there are more people, there's over 2 million members at Bigger Pockets, and many of them are pro members. This is where you get access to the best stuff, the best podcasts, the best webinars, the best videos, the best blog articles, the best books. Bigger pockets, we're dominating pretty much everything in the investing and educational space. So, this commitment you're making to get into pro is less than the cost of a home inspection on a condo. Okay. Not even, I, Rob, what did we pay for our home inspection on the Scott's? Oh, Dallas? man. Uh, 1200 bucks. <laughs> okay. And I bet it could have been yeah. worse, right? Oh, so yeah. this is like four of those basically that you're gonna that you're gonna pay to sign up here. That's gonna get you in the door and get you connected. So if the, if part of your goal was for 2022 was to get into the real estate investing game, this is a great way to do it. Yeah, I really wouldn't like I wouldn't downplay the networking here, right? Like the the forums are popping off all the time. There are uh, kind of some you know like icons even within the forums too. Like we just had Jonathan Green on not too long ago. And he's very iconic in the forums because he's just helping people, right? Like the community helps each other. They answer each other's questions. They help build each other up. And we're all here to help each other get into our first, second, third, fourth, 10th deal. Amen to that. And one of the things I like to say is if you do nothing right now, 10 years down the road, 10 years has passed. Whether you take action today, whether you don't take action today, 10 years is going to go by and you're going to look back and you're going to have had that time pass regardless of what you did. So you're, the 10 year from now version of yourself can either say, thank you 
2022 David for making the decisions that you made that made me more physically fit, more financially fit, better relationships, happier person, better life, better family. Or you can look back and say, man, I wish I would have done something before. And this is the same thing if you start right now and you look back at 2012 version of you. Are you really glad with the decisions you made, what you committed to, what you invested in? Or are you kicking yourself saying, I should have bought more real estate. I should have started investing. I should have got more serious. I should have dove in deeper. If you make a decision right now and you stick with it, it is impossible to not be better off five years down the road, 10 years down the road. But if you don't make a different decision right now, you can guarantee you're going to be thinking the same thoughts, doing the same stuff that you are right now. You're just going to be 10 years older. Yeah, 100%. Look, it might be a little scary, guys, but I personally think that growth comes from fear. So um, I guess I'll leave it there, man. I mean, that, that, that was very... Those very impactful words you said there, my friend. A- anything that you want to leave the audience with before we go? Uh, how about how about this? Because uh, usually we ask people, where, where can people find out more about you, Dave? If they, if they want to get your, your awesome knowledge bombs on the interwebs. Uh, you can follow me at David Green 24 Instagram is probably where I'm most um, active. I recently got a social media Uh, company making some stuff for me. So it's finally cleaned up and looking like a professional Instagram should let me know what you guys think. Uh, On TikTok, I'm official David Green. And then on YouTube, I'm David Green Real Estate. Recently just got on CNN and did an interview there about interest rates, what we can expect in the market, house hacking. And uh, like bigger pockets, I saw posted that today. So if you guys want to see, it was like a five minute section on Mother's Day. Uh, Go to my Instagram. You can check that out. Awesome, man. Yeah, I saw that, dude. That was, that's very cool of you. Now I don't know. I don't know how I can one up that. That's you've done it. You've become you're you're a, a news anchor now. Yeah, I'm anchor man. But you've got that quaff. I don't think you ever have to worry about one upping <laughs> me as long as you're rocking that that quaff. Yeah, I guess that's true. And Rob, if people would like to hear more about your stunning success in the tiny home and short term rental space, where can they learn more? Oh, you know, just the typical channels. You can find me on YouTube at Rob Built R O B U I L T. You can also find me on Instagram at Rob Built, and then on TikTok at Rob Bilto. Um, reach out, say what's up, leave a comment, leave a like, and uh, yeah, that that's it, man. That that's the show. We did it. We showed people how to get started. If you get started today from this episode, do me a favor, leave us a comment in the YouTube channel and in this video, and let us know because we always like to see who out there is taking action. And if you are on the fence, I highly encourage you go to biggerpockets.com slash pro upgrade, sign up for pro. You get a money back guarantee if for some reason you don't like it, but it will change the way that you have a relationship with real estate. Your identity will slowly shift into someone who has committed to it, not just someone who's at the outside of the gym, looking at the windows of the people working out, wishing you could be in there with them. Yeah. And don't forget to use promo code REPOD22 for 20% off. And with that, David, you wanna you wanna sign us off here? This is David Green for Rob the Improv Abasolo. Signing off.